fucking weird. Okay, there it is. Please let me know that you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up. Let me know that you can hear me. It still amazes me. I'm trying to share this and I'm not sure if it's going to allow me to do it. Hmm. Please let me know if you can hear me. And we are going to get started here in just a second. Give me a thumbs up or something so I know that you can hear me. I see people are coming on. Can you give me a thumbs up so that I know that you can hear me? Please. Okay, well, we're going to get started here in about two minutes. So again, if you can give me a thumbs up, I just need to make sure that you guys can hear me because I'm not sure. I'm not getting any thumbs up. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, well, amen. We're going to get started. Um, real quick, I'm going to share this. So we are coming from Jeremiah today. Um, kind of not really all over Jeremiah, but just Jeremiah the prophet as an intercessor. Um, so we are going to pray and then we are going to get started um this is very strange um it's not letting me tag mm, i don't know why it's doing this holy spirit okay well amen jesus Father, we just thank you for who you are and we bless your holy and righteous name. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. You are worthy to be praised and we say thank you today. We bless your name, God, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um, hmm, help Holy Spirit. Help, help, help. Okay, there we go. That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. We'll do that. Okay, that's what we'll do. Amen. All right, so uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah as the prophet, intercessor, all of that. That is who he was. And I'm sure you know that Jeremiah was known as a major prophet. Um, and all that simply means is that his time as a prophet was longer than some of the other prophets. There were only uh, four, I believe, four major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. But there were five books that pertain to those prophets. Jeremiah had two books. Uh, it was certainly the book of Jeremiah and then the book of Lamentations. People say it different ways, but that's who Jeremiah was. Um, 
Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet, you know, and, and considering what he had to contend with, with the children of Israel, no wonder he was always re weeping. And so uh, Jeremiah was considered the weeping prophet. And um, he dealt with the people and their unfaithfulness to God. They were constantly doing stuff to demonstrate that they did not trust God. They would not obey God. Um, and so he was constantly crying out uh, to God on their behalf to the point that at one point in scripture, God tells Jeremiah, stop talking to me about these people. Stop praying to me about them. No, they are stiff necked and I don't want you to say nothing else to me about them. And so I want to read Jeremiah, part of Jeremiah 1, into your hearing. I think that scripture is key to um, laying the foundation about Jeremiah. And you may have heard this in weeks past as Pastor Hill um, was going uh, through this passage. So Jeremiah is called to ministry in Jeremiah 1. And God says, so from the womb, God calls Jeremiah. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I consecrated you. I called you for a purpose and an assignment. He said, before you were born, I had done this. He said, and I appointed you. I appointed you as a prophet. If I had time, I would talk to you a little bit about the difference between an assignment and an appointment, um, a call and an appointment. Uh, all of those things we use interchangeably, but they have some, some little nuances that make them a little different. Even when we talk about an anointing, often the anointing comes before the appointing amen before you're sent on an assignment appointments it's just like any other appointment it it's a set time it's it's for that time it's for that moment it's for that season and um that's what you're there to do and so uh he said i told you that he said um sovereign god this is what jeremiah says to him i do not know how to speak I am too young. And the a lot of times people think that maybe Jeremiah was a teenager or he was like eight years old or something. No, he was not. He was about 24. But can you imagine? You know what you was doing at 24. Can you imagine being called to ministry at 24 to a nation as a prophet? And God tells you, go. Because um, there's some things I need for you to say to these people. That I'm sure that was nerve wracking. So he was like, I don't even know what to say. I'm too young. God, don't make me do this. But the Lord says back to Jeremiah, do not say to me, I'm too young. That's a word right there for somebody. Stop talking about I'm too young. I'm too old. My time has passed. Um, I put a word on Facebook the other day and the Holy Spirit said, you may have had a slow start, but I'm going to give you a strong finish. That should make somebody happy. You may have had a slow start, but I'm going to give you a strong finish. Amen. Be encouraged. God has a plan for your life. He goes on to say, God goes on to say to Jeremiah, look, you must go and, and to everyone that I send you to. Basically, everything I tell you to do, you need to do it. Everything I tell you to do, you need to do it. And so that's a word for somebody today right there. We're going to get to Jeremiah, the intercessor. But it was important that we lay the foundation about who Jeremiah was. He said, do not be afraid of them. When I send you, he said, don't be afraid of these people. He said, because I'm going to go with you. He said, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. The Lord says, he tells him to reach out his hand, touch your mouth. He said, and I will put my words in your mouth. That's that right there should just, yeah. God's not going to send you on an assignment. He's not going to. You may have a call on your life, but you have not been given an assignment. You may have been called to be a pastor, but you don't have a church yet. So you don't have an assignment. You don't have an appointment. You got an anointing, but you don't have an appointment. 
God hasn't sent you anywhere yet to do the work that he is going to send you to do. So you just keep preparing until God puts his word in your heart and in your mouth. So he goes on to say, um, he asked Jeremiah, what do you see? So now he's teaching him how to prophesy. He's teaching him how to have a vision. He's teaching him how to declare a thing. Mm, that's good right there. Let me tell you, stop saying you're called to things and you have had no preparation with God, with the word in prayer and fasting and equipping from your pastor or, or that the person who has a, the, the gift that, or we call it the offices in the body of, in the black church, I guess, or in the, um, charismatic church um these offices uh, apostle prophet pastor evangelist pastor teacher and nobody has equipped you no one has trained you and so god told him i will put my words in your mouth he said so um he said i appoint you today over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot to tear down to destroy and to overthrow and to build and to plant now uh we have prophets in the house today and they think that that's all they're there to do. Well, that was this dispensation of what the prophets were supposed to do. Um, you ain't got no business trying to tear down no church. That's not your job. Those of you who believe your call to the office of the prophet. Amen. That's not your job. He goes on to say, um, he asked him, what does he see? He says, I see a branch of an almond tree. He said, the Lord said, um, you have seen correctly. So you are already prophesying correctly because it's my word. It's my spirit, meaning God's, that I put in you. So he sends him on his assignment. He said, get ready. I, uh, in, in verse 27, he said, get ready, stand up and say, stand up and say, and whatever I command you to do, do it. He said, do not be terrified of them. He said, because if you scatter them, he said, you'll be terrified he said, I will terrify you before them. If you're scared of them, I'm going to make you scared of them. So go with God. Go with God. Go with God. Know that God is with you and don't have God have to put you on blast. Amen. So that's the background of Jeremiah. So again, he is a, I'm trying to see if, hmm. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to see. There they go. Okay. Amen. Hello, Mika Hayes, uh, ministry vet. Um, so he says, Jeremiah, again, a major prophet. The only reason he's a major prophet is because his book is longer than some of the other prophets. And his time in serving was long. Jeremiah served for almost, Jeremiah served for almost four decades. And in serving... Uh, he, his assignment, his appointment was to the kingdom of Judah. Amen. And so, again, known as the, the weeping prophet, because he was always crying about these stiff necked people to the point that I said earlier when we first started that God said, stop talking to me about them because they stiff necked. They're not going to listen. He says, so I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. And this was significant um, I thank our pastor, Pastor A. Thomas Hill of the Streams Church. I thank God for him um, that today this is this is the section of Jeremiah that God has given to me. I remember early on uh, that the pastor has assigned me to share. I remember early on the prophet that God would almost, good evening, Sister Yvette, that God would always align me with was Jeremiah. I'm sorry, with Isaiah. I never quite got with Jeremiah. Uh, just all that crying and constantly going to God about the same stuff. And I know that my anointing is strategic. And Isaiah was more of a strategic prophet. Like he would see it and tell him exactly what to do and how to do it. But the thing about Jeremiah... Uh, that is significant versus Isaiah is Jeremiah's crying out for the people is totally aligned with the prophet who was an intercessor, Ezekiel, as well as Daniel, but definitely Jeremiah. And this is the, how do I say? Yes, this is the book. This is the prophet that often in my season of God birthing an intercessor, uh, out of me, in me, and then out of me, was having me go to Jeremiah and learning how to cry out for the people of God. Amen. 
And so, um, like I said, he was about 24 years old when God sent him on his assignment. He called him from birth, from the womb, but he sent him on an assignment at about 24. And that's where we enter in to Jeremiah 21. So again, never say you're too old. I can't do that. Um, I don't have enough. God, no, no, never say that again. Amen. So, um, Again, uh, the people of Israel just would not listen. They would do what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do it. And it just got on God's nerves. And Jeremiah wanted to stop praying for him, quite honestly. And so, uh, for, the, for, for example, they would do what they knew they were not supposed to do. And they would keep doing it. It's like, you know that adultery is wrong. Hey, Brandy. You know that adultery is wrong, but you keep doing adultery, okay? That's the stuff that they were doing. And so we know how the Old Testament would go. God would send a prophet, the prophet would warn them, and then God would send judgment. Well, today God is still sending his prophets, but he is the judgment. There's, he's not sending a king to judge us, right? He's sending... It's going to be him when judgment comes. Amen. And the thing about um, this text, when a uh, pastor told me that this was the part of the study, and you can go to our website, it's in the link, it's in the post to download the study. When he gave this to me, it was very critical because one of the things God has been speaking to me, which I'm sure I've gone live about, you probably heard me say, that a woe is coming to the land. And a woe is coming because the people of God and the people of this world and specifically of this nation, prideful. And the pride looms uh, right at haughtiness and arrogance. And so this text about Jeremiah and his assignment to the body of Christ was that there was a constant God was giving woes, woe to the people. And so um, when you continue to do things that you know are not the will of God, God is not looking for anybody to be perfect. God is not looking for anybody because let me tell you something. At the point that you do not have sin, you are sinless versus sinning less. <laughs> but if you are at the point that you are sinless, you are probably in glory. Amen. You are in heaven. Amen. Because there's no one in this earth that will be without sin. And the beauty of being a believer in Christ without a struggle, the beauty of being in Christ is that we can continue to come to him and ask God to help us and, and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And he said, if you are, if you confess your sins, you are faithful and just, he, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And so we have this opportunity to come to God and to ask God to help us and to cleanse us and to deliver us. And he will, he will. And in the process, he will give us the strength to stand up under the temptation that we do not have to keep giving in to the sin. But these children of Israel and people of today in the church, not in the church, say, but don't go to church. The struggle is often. Some people ain't struggling. Some people ain't struggling. They are perfectly content in their sin, knowing that the thing that they're doing is against God's will and against his word. And I would wonder, the question isn't, are you saved? The question becomes, have you submitted your life to Christ as Lord? You're saved, so he's your savior. But is he Lord that you have come under him and said, you can correct me. You can bring conviction to me. Not that you got to give him permission. But when you've made him Lord, you say you reign and rule over my life. And so I give you permission, God. I want you to correct me because I want to be like you. I want to be more like you. Well, this is where the children of Israel were and they were not. This is where Jeremiah was and where God was because the children of Israel was not crying out like that. Amen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Trianda. Sister James, how are you? Um, so, um, that's where they were. And because that's where they were, God sent the prophet to deal with them. So, here we are. Um, he says, 
Um, so as I started studying this, I thought to myself, um, so what did that look like, Holy Spirit? They would continue to sin, do whatever they wanted to do. They would show up at the temple and they would make their sacrifices. They would make their sacrifices to God. They would worship God through sacrifice. The great I am come and stand before the great I, great I am Jehovah. I am whatever you need me to be. If you need me to be a deliverer, I can be that. You need me to um, be your way of escape. I can be that. Whatever you need, I am available to you. Hey, Sister Rosemary. He said, but they would do all of that, but they would not acknowledge how they were living their lives day to day. They would just uh, give themselves over to the sins of commission. The sins of commission. Now, I want to touch on something here, and I'm asking God, do I wait? So, um, they would give themselves over to these sins. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. And we're going to get to that, uh, Brother John. And so, he says, as it relates to what they are doing here uh, in the book of Jeremiah and why he was called the weeping prophet. Can you imagine you're trying to be the pastor um, that is trying to live right and trying to present Christ to the body of the church in a way that pleases God, but yet you know that the people are showing up to church when their hearts are not right, when they are doing everything under the sun with no conviction. I'm not even going to say that they went to the club. I'm not even going to say that. They went to the club and then they came to church. I'm glad you went to the club and came to church. If you're saying, Lord, I want to do something different. I want to be better for you. You you got a, a stealing spirit. You got a lying spirit. You're fornicating. You're having sex with folks outside of marriage and you okay with it. You're committing adultery and you're okay with it. You have an alternative lifestyle, homosexuality, and you're okay with it. You're, you're, um, mean and evil and hard to get along with and you're okay with it all of that that is totally different than struggling when you are struggling and saying lord i know this is wrong give me clean hands and a pure heart i want to be the one who can enter your most holy place who can he who has clean hands and a pure heart and not has not lifted up their soul unto vanity when you are crying out to God because you are saying, Lord, I want to be right for you. I want to be more like you. God loves that. I said to someone today, I remember when I was at Eastern Star and I heard Pastor Johnson say, um, God honors the days, the weeks, the months, the years that you've gone without committing that sin. He, he, he honors that. And I was like, oh my God. And so his grace becomes sufficient and his grace covers the multitude of your sin. But when you just out there doing whatever you want to do, that's dangerous. It scares me when I hear people say, oh, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I, I know it's a sin and I'm not okay with it, but this is what I choose to do. That frightens me. It frightens me for them and it frightens me for the people who are in relationship around them. Because we know what God did to the children of, of Israel with AI. We know what God did with Jacob and Leah and Rachel. You know, we know what God did when a house is, is the leader or someone in that space is in sin and they don't care. And this is why I know that God is saying there is a woe coming to this land because this country is prideful. From the top leaders of government down to us as individuals, and I encourage you, beloved, to examine your heart. Someone put in here, America, 
by large needs to repent. I'm going to bring that down to its lowest level. You and I need to repent. Leaders need to repent. Pastors need to uh, repent. Anybody that has leadership responsibility over someone else, whether you are a manager in a company, a director, a president of a company or this country, good God almighty, because we are a prideful people. And where pride exists is all matter of sin. It comes before a fall and a haughty spirit, before destruction. And God is saying there is a woe. And I'm going to read a scripture into your hearing shortly. So, this sin of commission. So, consider this. Co. The word co means together. It means mutual, like in agreement. Follow me. The sin of commission, the sin of commission, knowing that what you are doing is wrong, but you keep doing it anyway. And you are okay with it. The sin of omission is a mistake. You know, you, you, uh, it's a sin. It's the failure to do something often related to laws. Like you, you didn't slow down. So now you get a ticket. So it's the transgressions against God or of God or against the land. It's not something that you uh, purposely set out to do. It's not something that you are consciously uh, seeking to do because you enjoy doing it. It's, it's not uh, laying aside the weights and the sins that so easily entangle you. And you don't want to lay them aside because you like them. <laughs> you like what you're doing. I believe I've shared this. I'm not sure if I've shared it before, but I know I've shared it um, in ministry before that I remember when the Holy Spirit says there are two things that have kept you Tuesday. There are two things that have kept you daughter. One, you're crying out to me for Lord, help me. I don't want to do this. I know this is wrong. I know this is what your word says and your tithe. Because his word said, I will rebuke the devourer. We often only use that as it relates to money. But understand anything that is coming to devour your joy, your peace, your um, finances, your relationships, your sanity, your confidence, your credit score. Whatever has come to devour you, God said, your tithe allows him to rebuke it. Anything that wants to bring you shame and embarrassment because of your pride or because your past, excuse me, because of your past or because of your struggles. He said, I'll rebuke it and it will not have take charge over you. And that is the love of God. That is the grace of God. And I want to encourage you to tap into that, beloved. Ask God to examine your heart. If there is any wicked or unclean thing in me, God, take it out. Give me your heart. Circumcise my heart. God, take away pride and arrogance. This need to be right and, and to bring other people down and to build yourself up. God don't like that. And so here is Jeremiah. Commission. So what is commission? The word co, C-O, literally means to together, to be together, to be mutual, to have something in common. A co-worker, a co-dependent, a co-defendant. It is, it is literally inferring that you are already one. So what's a mission? A mission is an assignment. Remember Jeremiah? He had an assignment. He had an appointment from God. So it is us coming into when it's not God. Hear me because there's no there's no blessing of commission. I mean, I guess we could say that. But typically commission is used when it's relate, related to sin. So you are on a mission to sin. You have come into agreement with the sin that has been in your life, that keeps causing you to stumble, that it keeps causing you to trip, that is holding you back from God elevating you to the next level. You have come into agreement with that. Oh, beloved, hate what God hates and love what God loves. The Bible is clear in James when it talks about how sin grows. And he don't want the sin in your life to grow. 
But the longer you stay in it and you keep pacifying it and saying, oh, I'm a man. God understands that I have needs. Oh, um, I just got to do this because I needed to, to, you know, uh, level out my stress. I just need to, you know, take a little hit of this and drink a little hit of that. And God ain't tripping on you, you know, having a little spirits. <laughs> he ain't tripping on that. But are you using it to get drunk? To pacify your emotions. To, to pacify your feelings. What are you doing to pacify your feelings? It just may be you, you always in somebody's bed that ain't your spouse. Because you don't want to feel. And all that's about is a release. I know this is grown folks stuff. So I'm not sure if any young people are on here. But I'm coming after it. Because I believe all things are strategic. Because of all the weeks that Pastor Hill could have given me to share, this was the one. And so I must be and walk in who God has called me to be in this earth. And I am encouraging you. I am imploring you. I am pleading with God's people. What we used to say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. God is still resetting. And if you recall what I said, what the Lord allowed me to share back in March, he said, what you do in this season will set you up, good God Almighty, for when you come out of this boy. So allow God to examine your heart. Part of the reason we are still in this mess is because of pride, is because of arrogance, because of a haughty spirit, because people don't want people to tell them what to do and people want to do it their way. And so here we are with Jeremiah as the prophet who cries out to God because the people of God were committing sins of commission. They knew exactly what they were doing and they were okay with doing it. And so the Catholic Church calls, they, the Catholic Church defines, they have like two sins, which is very interesting to me. Um, Sin, someone says sin, sister, I can't see your name, Sister Price. She says sin is a lack of trusting God to fulfill a need. And so we try to fill it outside of God's will. That's an interesting way of putting it. Sin is sin. Some stuff ain't about need. Some stuff is want. Some stuff is I just want to do what I want to do. Some It's just you stubborn, you hard-headed. Some stuff ain't about a need. Because, listen, God didn't care if somebody, I ain't going to say he didn't care, but he gave a way of escape for somebody who had a need and they were hungry and they stole something because they were hungry. He said, send them uh, to the city of refuge. He said, don't punish them, don't kill them. Most of our sins are because it ain't even about trusting God sometimes. It's just, I want what I want and I'm selfish. And I think I should have it when I want it. And God could be blessing them and they're still sinning. Come on, you, you could have God gave you a good job, good home, nice car, paid off debt, all of this stuff, but you still laying up with people you ain't married to. So what's that? That's just because you want it. it. Ain't got nothing to do with a need. Nothing to do with a need. Mm -mm. But I, I, I feel you. Sometimes it is need, Sister Price. I feel what you're saying. But ultimately, it, all of it is being outside of God's will. Amen. And so uh, the Catholics say that there are two types of sins. There is a moral sin and that sin puts you in danger. Sins of commission put you in danger. They call them uh, yeah, mortal sins. They put you in danger. And so when you come into agreement, when you commission, and you say, I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, with who I want to do it. It puts you in danger. God says to know to do right and not do is a sin. So as a believer, as a Christian, beloved, and you know, we know what we're doing is not of God. And you have no conviction, not talking about guilt, not talking about embarrassment, not talking about shame. I'm talking about conviction of the Holy Spirit. But I contend that if you do not, if you have not made God Lord, that means the Holy Spirit does not have free reign to move over and in your life whenever he wants to and understand he's still a gentleman 
He's just, I mean, there's sometimes he's just going to bogart you and do like, look, your little hard head self, I'm going to come right up and through here right now and get it together and get you together. But most of the time he's giving us time. He's giving us time to repent, to change our mind about that thing. He's giving us time. And once I, I recently had somebody say, well, I didn't even realize, you know, I've never seen in the Bible that the Bible talked about, I'm just going to say it because we grown and, um, and it's important that we are transparent. And someone said to me, I didn't know the Bible talked about pornography. Where is that? And that man, you shouldn't look at it. And I said, well, um, I can't, I can't remember the word, um, but there is a word when you talk about sin and fornication that the root of it comes from um, pranava, prana, pranaya, which is where we get the word pornography. And so it's in there, but God just don't come out talking about it like that. But he says, if your eye, if your eye causes you to sin, he said, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, we don't want y'all to be, you know, just cutting and start plucking stuff, right? That ain't what we're saying. But in that sin of pornography, those are the two things you use. And so it's very applicable. But we do what we want to do, and sin is sin. And again, I'm going to keep saying that God is not looking for you to be perfect. He's not looking for you to be perfect. He's just looking for you to cry out and ask him for help. And that's what the children of Israel would not do unto the point that God said, stop talking to me about them because my judgment is coming. And so he would warn them and he would plead with them to be faithful to God. Now they may do it. Thank you, Sister Faith. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's it. He would... He, they would get it together for a little bit, and then they would go about doing it again. Romans 1 talks about uh, turning us over to a reprobate mind, to a mind that just wants to do whatever it wants to do. And God says, is that where you want to be? I'm going to let you be there. When you get a chance, go and read Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to read it all, but this is what the Lord said in Romans chapter 8. He said, for God does not overlook sin. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness of men in their wickedness that they suppress truth. Remember I said that we will go along and keep doing what we're doing and the longer we do it, um, we that sin overtakes us. And so he said, so you, you just keep doing it. I'm going to jump down to verse 20. What about so verse 21, he said, for even though, even though they knew God as the creator, they did acknowledge him or honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous acts. That's exactly what they were doing in with Jeremiah. That is exactly they did not acknowledge him. They did not acknowledge him as God. They did not acknowledge his preeminence, his sovereignty, his love, his grace, his mercy. And that is what we do today. And I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. We thank him when we didn't get in the car accident. We thank him when we did got stopped, but the policeman didn't give us a ticket. But... I, remember, I used to speed all the time. God, I used to speed all the time. And would have a nerve to be arguing with police in my 20s, early 30s, all these little sports cars. I'd be, why did you stop me? I knew why he stopped me. And there were times that they did maybe stop me, and it was, was for no cause. But I knew why he stopped me. Just wrong. And you know you're wrong, but you want to argue about it. God just wants us to repent, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And he has promised to exalt us in due season. To just say, God, I want to be right for you. I want to please you. That's all he wants. And so the Bible says, because they would not acknowledge him. He said, he go, he, 
They claim to be wise. They claim to be intelligent, but God says they become fools. That was in verse 22. He goes on in verse 23. He says they exchange the glory and the majesty and the excellence of God. He said um, for sin, for mortal, for mortal man. Remember the, the Catholics call it mortal sin, the sin that is dangerous, that God will eventually turn you over to. It all comes together, beloved. And God just wants us to just want to be right. And I thank God. I've said this many times. I thank God for people who are struggling. I thank God for my struggles. I thank God for your struggles. Because that means that God has not turned you over to them. There is still time. Hallelujah. Thank you for grace and thank you for mercy. So he goes on to say, and we know that this is the, the text that God starts talking about, you know, men exchange, you know, their desires for men and women for women uh, in the New Testament. He said, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vile passions. He says, so because you just kept doing what you wanted to do, this is in alignment with where uh, Jeremiah was and Jeremiah was sick of it. And the Bible says that he, for his generation, he screamed out to his generation. Remember John the Baptist in the wilderness screaming out? There's always a parallel to someone in the Old Testament, to someone in the New Testament. And I contend that there are people that if you are called to certain uh, ascension offices or gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, pastor, teacher, there is someone in scripture that you can align your gift and your calling with. And I encourage you to go find them. And so he says, he's crying out to them. You know, John the Baptist said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Jeremiah was saying, please stop sinning because God is going to get you. Please acknowledge his grace. We know that the word says, should I go on sinning so that grace can abound? And, and one translation says, no, I ain't gonna say that. But certainly not. No, we won't misuse God's grace. But the Bible says he was crying out to these generations, a woe, the woe is coming. When you get a chance, I want you to read Isaiah 5. Start at about chapter 8, I'm sorry, verse 8 through 25. And I'm going to read some of these scriptures into your hearing. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8. And you can put these scriptures, if someone can, in the comments. Romans chapter 1. Of course, Jeremiah 1. Romans chapter 1 and Isaiah 5. And this is what the word says. Woe, woe, judgment is coming to those who join house to house and field to field to increase their own holdings and depriving others who have less because you are greedy. Just follow me. A woe is coming. He says in verse 8, he said, woe, a judgment is coming to the land to those who drag along wickedness with cords of falsehoods, who continuously lie. A woe is coming. Woe, a judgment is coming, verse 20, for those who call evil good and good evil. For those who substitute darkness, you know that person is a sinner. Everything about them was a sin. When you got connected with them, when you brought when you brought them before the world and said it was a prophetic word, you knew they were an adulterer. You know that they said derogatory things about women. Somebody said that every time I preach a word that that is on point or minister a word, my earring falls off. And this one just fell off. Amen, God. So I know I'm in the vein of the Lord. You knew. You knew what they said about handicapped people. You knew what they said about black people. You knew what they, their feelings were about Latino people. You knew that he called that Senator Pocahontas. You knew all of that. But you still wanted him in a high position, knowing he was a liar. God said a woe is coming. He said, judgment is coming to those who um, 
Holy Spirit, who who give who substitutes darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitutes bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You don't mind bringing strife into situations. You are okay with that. God said a woe is coming. He said a woe is coming and judgment is coming to those who are wise in their own eyes. I'm the smartest one. I can do all of this. I'm smarter than the colonels. I'm smarter than the generals. Five star generals. I know how to do all of it. I know how to turn this around. I know how to turn that around. God says, and you are in the highest position in this country. And what you must understand is that every anointing, every oil, excuse me, Holy Spirit, every oil flows. Every oil flows. From the head, down the beard, to the skirt. Every oil flows. He said, you, a judgment is coming to those of you who are wise in your own eyes because you think you clever and you think you shrewd in your own sight because you operate in trickery. You got one hand out front and another hand is behind your back and you doing stuff under the desk and under the table, business deals. But I don't know about what they did. They getting arrested all around you, but somehow you keep coming up clean a woe is coming and a woe is coming the holy spirit says to all those who know what the word says but you keep putting blinders on because it's your agenda there is no agenda except god's agenda he said for those who justify verse 23 jeremiah 1 I mean, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah 5. He said, for those who justify the wicked and acquit them, acquit them, acquit them, and take away the rights of those who are in the right and who are wicked, who put people who are trying to get asylum or trying to come over here to escape the cruelty of their country, and you put them in cages and separate them from their children and parents and kids he said oh yes he said a woe is coming therefore the tongue of fire will consume down to the stubble and the straw i encourage you to read isaiah 5 he said the people of israel he was an intercessor who continued to cry out because the children of israel shunned god's mercy they laughed at God's grace. Good God Almighty. You just think you're entitled and that's just that's just what God does. No, God's gives but God God's gonna bless you. Absolutely. You woke up this morning. That's a blessing. Started you on your way. You were in your right mind. All of those things are blessings. But remember the word of the Lord says, I give grace where I choose to give grace. And I give mercy where I choose to give mercy. The challenge of that text, of that scripture, is that we don't know when he's going to give grace. We don't know when he's going to extend mercy. But God, who's rich in mercy. Romans 6, verse, verse 1 and verse 15 says, Well then, since God's grace <coughs> has set us free from the law of sin, and the Bible says death, <coughs> Does that mean that we should go on sinning so that more grace can abound? I said this earlier. Certainly not. Romans 6 and Romans, Romans 6, 1 and, and 15. He said, no, we shouldn't do that. So God is continuing just like Isaiah, Jeremiah, warning the people and saying, a oh, woe is coming. That, that was his whole ministry. Now remind now remember Ju, um Isaiah was the prophet to Judah which means praise praiseworthy he was he was the prophet to Judah whose king was <coughs> Josiah and he was a good king he was a good king one of one of the most godly kings that there was but yet this is still, help me, Jesus, 
help me, Jesus. This is still what was going on in the land. So though we have an election coming up and we <clears throat> have everyone talking about the character of who's running uh, for president against the current president and how wonderful his character is and how good of a man he is and he's led by his faith and that's great. I love that. And he's talking about he wants to bridge people and, 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 and bring people back together and stop the hate. And that's wonderful that we get back to some semblance of humanity. But hear me. It was a good king in the land with a solid prophet giving him the word. But the people. And so from the top down individually collectively as leaders as churches as pastors wherever you lead examine your heart examine your motives me too me too since god spoke it to me over a month ago every time i see it come up god kill it kill that pride kill my need to be right kill my need to have the last word come on y'all don't act like it's just me give me some thumbs up or something I know it's tight, but it's right. And if you hear it, you, God's going to... And this is the other thing, and I want to leave this with you. The Holy Spirit said, for those who are seeking me to do right and to be right, you will be covered. You will be covered. Because again, it's not about being perfect. The work ain't going to be done. It, it takes a long time to dig up all that pride, right? But the fact that you're asking God, he's pleased with that. And his grace, his love covers a multitude of sin. That should be good news to somebody. Your mission in God is important. Do not let anything take you off your post and interfere with you accomplishing the mission that God has for your life. Don't come in agreement with anything that is not of God. Only agree with what God agrees with. Hate what he hates and love what he loves. The Bible, This study goes on to say that Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived his life. Listen. Responding to the trumpet of God. And he served as an example to generations. Serve as an example to to generations. Mother Crow has served as an example to generations. Let the, the, the older women teach the younger. Serving as generations. At that point, it's me now. It's you, Abby. It's you, um, uh, Yvette. We're the older now. <laughs> and there are people that we need to start being, and we and you have been, an example in front of. But the Bible, but, but this study says that Jeremiah's life, he lived his life responding to the trumpet of God. What's the trumpet of God? The trumpet of God is the buildup to God's return. It's the buildup that's telling you be on alert because the trumpet was used for two different things. It was used to, well, three. It was used to warn, it was used to announce, and it was used to break forth a praise. What you using your trumpet for? This mouth right here. What you using it for? Are you using it to warn people? Are you using it to tell people Jesus is the way? I'm telling you. I can shelter in and do all that I'm trying to do. And then people still getting COVID around you. But the grace of God for some reason has been over your life. while you going to work every day? Oh my God. That should make somebody shout right there. Sound off the trumpet of praise and give God thanks. It's, it's used to warn the enemy is coming. The enemy is coming to put you on alert. And it's used to let you know judgment is coming. How are you using your trumpet, your mouth? How are you using this weapon? of warfare in prayer how are you using it in your relationships with your children with your spouse at work it's a trumpet y'all it's a trumpet oh god it's a trumpet good god almighty it's a trumpet this voice hallelujah 
It's a trumpet. What are you using it for? Are you warning anybody? Are you praising? Are you telling them to get ready? Well, how are you using it? So he said, the this lesson says that he used his life to respond to the trumpet, responding to the trumpet of God. He lived a life responding to the trumpet, to the warnings of God, to the words of God. So how do you do that? You, you do that by being ready. You, you, you do that by having a prayer life. So whenever God's, God's voice speaks, whenever God tells you to do something, you're ready. You're ready. Because you're praying, because you're fasting, because you are, you are worshiping God, you're serving. It said he lived his life as service, as an example to other generations. That's good. That's good. So living our lives, responding to the trumpet that's being on alert, that's being ready, that's listening to God, that's waiting in God's presence, that's waiting on God for him to speak. And sometimes he don't speak and you okay with that too. That's what intercessors do. Now, you might not be called to a nation as an intercessor and he was a prophet. You might not be called to your church as a prophet. I hope they'll use you to pray if you're called to intercession. You may not be called to a region. Drew, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the world. There's four places that you're sent. Everybody ain't sent to the world. Everybody ain't sent to Samaria, which is the, the con country. Jerusalem, your city, Judea, your state. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, your country, and the other most parts of the world. Everybody ain't sent to all them places. Know your space. But when you get there, and you know your assignment, and you know your appointment, like Jeremiah, ask God to put the word. He didn't ask God. God just did it. But I'm telling you, you can ask God to give you what to say. And only say what he tells you to say. Don't be like Balaam. Okay? Okay? And saying what, what you want to say. Because you want to get the rewards of Balak. Ah, intercessors. Intercessors. We must pray. We must pray. And that's a greater conviction to me even as I'm teaching this. There's a deeper level of prayer. There's another place in prayer that God desires for me to go. And I know that. So. Yes. The woes of God are condemnation. It's, it's absolutely uh, the wrath of God and uh, it's the judgment of God upon God's enemies. I see what you're saying, Brother Peterson, but do you think it's possible as a Christian to live your life as an enemy of God because of the things we choose to do that we know are not his will and against his word? And I'm telling you, it is. His grace is is covering us. The blood of Jesus covers us because he's giving us time. He's giving us time. And when we have our own agenda and we put our agenda above God's agenda, thinking that God don't know how to handle uh, the cares of this world, the sins of this world, so people are okay with raising up sin to put sin and lawlessness over a country, there's a woe coming. Because this is the country that even down to its money has God on it. And God, we what? Trust. And so I pray that we become like Jeremiah, where we live a life responding to the warnings of God, the alerts of God, the promptings to praise God, to pray as intercessors, to worship as intercessors, to turn our plates over as intercessors. We said early on, everyone may not be called an intercessor, but everyone's called to pray. Everyone and anyone can stand in the gap. Everyone may not be called to spiritual warfare, but everybody can pray. When you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. 
And so I encourage you today. I encourage you today to seek God for your life, for your heart. Ask him to examine it, to give you clean heart, clean hands and a pure heart. A soul that is in no way lifted unto vanity, which is pride and haughtiness. And ask him to bring you before people who can you can share the word of God with. Amen. 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 The trumpet is sounding. The trumpet is God is still resetting and the trumpet is sounding and God wants us ready. He wants us ready. I, I want to share this story. I was in a training a few weeks ago and it starts actually again this weekend. And there was a scenario where we had to uh, be on a boat and um, we, we had to and this boat was all about being on this boat with people who had purpose. And so you get on this boat knowing that you have purpose and the boat starts to sink. Well, there's a boat that three people can get on. And so you declare if you're going to stay on the ship that is going down or are you willing to get off the ship and be one of the three that saves their own life. And I chose to get off the ship and get on the boat, the lifeboat, because I knew that I had purpose and I knew that there were more things for me to accomplish. Someone said, well, as a minister, you should have stayed on the ship with the people. And this is what I said. If the ship is going down, I need you to follow me. If the ship is going down, I'm going to give them Jesus. I'm going to tell them that God loves them and to make sure that they have confessed as much as I can, that they have confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And when the ship goes down, because you didn't, you thought to stay on the ship, but I said, I'm going to take my purpose and my calling and my gifts and my anointing and get back to shore and save more lives and give Jeez, and have this testimony and give it to more people. When the ship is going down and you see it and you want to stay on the ship for what? Pride again? Arrogance again? Because you don't want to be wrong? Because you think you're right? Oh, you better get your tail off that ship and save your life and live your life on purpose and repent for all the foolishness. <laughs> God Almighty. And so, God is faithful. Please, in the post, um, sow your seed to the Streams Church. Uh, again, this is our Thursday uh, Bible study online. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, I'm Dr. Tuesday. I don't even know if I said that. Uh, Tuesday Tate. I have the privilege and the honor to serve at the Streams Church um, as an elder. And I thank God uh, that you received from me this evening. Again, members, please sow your uh, offering. If you didn't get a chance to submit your tithe on Sunday, you can do that today as well. And we thank you. Our prayer time every morning is 630 uh, on 630 is our prayer line. And I think that's in the post as well. I'm not sure. But also, uh, we go live on Facebook at 715 every morning. Uh, Pastor Hill shares a sermonette and a word of encouragement. And so, please join us. 630 every day. Prayer, 715 a.m. every day, live on Facebook. We're here on Facebook Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. And on Sundays at 1015 a.m. A.M. Amen. I love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray that something was shared with you uh, to give you a greater understanding about being an intercessor in this time. We have to cry out. We have to cry out. But while we crying out, we need to be asking God to fix us as well. And if you're not called, you believe to intercession, you are called to pray. And because you're in this land, this is a good time to ask God to show you you. Amen and to fix the things in us that is unlike him. I love you with the love of the Lord. Be encouraged. See you Sunday. God bless. Bye. Okay, it's not letting me log off. Hey, Marvin. God bless you guys. Blessings. Okay, that's very interesting. Guys, it's not letting me log off. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. I don't know what to do. That's crazy. All right. Bye. It is not letting me log off, guys. So you guys log off. I have never had this happen. Okay. Okay. Well, stay there. I'm going to have to log it off on my other computer. It is not letting me do it. Log off, guys, because we're done. I'm not sure why it's not um, doing, why it's not logging off. Hey, how you doing? Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, we're going to figure this out. Hope you all are having a great day. <laughs> we're going to figure this out. Did it? I think it did it. Nope, it did not. I've never had this happen. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Mm. Help Holy Spirit. I know. That's what I'm trying to do. But if I power down, I'm thinking the message won't load to our um, Healing Streams page. So that's what I'm thinking. But let me... I'm going to try to go to our page and see if I can do it from there. That's the only thing I can think of. So let me try it. Technology, right? Mm. This is crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. The devil mad. That's all. Because we came after him. And his kingdom. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh my God. I love the Lord. He's so good. He's so good. So let me see. If I can get on there from here. And. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, gosh. Well, I think I'm going to have to take Brother John's advice and power down. Hold on. Let me see. Maybe I can do it another way. Okay, I'm going to have to power down. I hope it uploads, okay? God bless you. I love you with the love of the Lord. You have a great evening.